I'm Farah Duro, and you're listening to the PCS Revolution Podcast. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the PCS Revolution Podcast. I'm here today with Kate Korsmeyer. She's the founder of Root and Revel, which is a blog that she writes from her home in Atlanta, Georgia. And she actually has PCOS herself, and she is a food writer as well. So I think that coming from her unique perspective, she's going to talk about some of the challenges she's run into. She's also a new mom, and she uh, is going to actually explain a little bit about how she's addressed her PCOS throughout the years and what's been really helpful for her. So I welcome Kate. Good to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And we've been wanting to get you on for a while, so I'm glad that you're here. Would you tell our audience a little bit about what's been um, what's been your involvement with your blog and, you know, as far as it relates to PCOS and what's um, made you want to write about it? Yeah, absolutely. So I was diagnosed with PCOS back in 2014, and I tried a few different ways to um, manage it more on the conventional side of things, and nothing was really working, and I was very frustrated, and I found a um, – well, actually, it started because I read this book called Woman Code that was – totally life-changing for me and really helped me understand what PCOS really meant and what was happening in my body. And that led me to searching for a functional medicine practitioner who was familiar with PCOS. And so I worked with her to kind of essentially heal my body of PCOS, reverse it um, naturally through holistic remedies and diet and, you know, getting rid of um, prescription medication and some of the other um more conventional techniques that that have a lot of dangerous side effects. And so once I saw the transformation in my own body from these holistic remedies, I was just so amazed and blown away. And I felt like I needed to share this with the world and that if I was struggling with this, I'm sure other women were too. So I started Root and Rebel to kind of share what I had learned and empower other women to heal their bodies naturally as well. Yeah, and your blog is amazing, and, and you've worked uh, with um, all kinds of magazines and newspapers, and the uh, USA Today, and Cooking Light, Eating Well, Travel and Leisure. So, how's this been um, a shift for you as far as what you you did before, um, prior to getting diagnosed with PCOS, and then and then now that you know kind of the right steps to take. Yeah, I was a um, restaurant reporter for national magazines for about eight years before I started Root and Rebel. So it was literally my job to go travel the world and report back on the most delicious food. And so it was amazing and fun and had a lot of great opportunities, but it ultimately was really not good for my health. Um, And specifically for my PCOS. So um, I kind of, I slowly transitioned out of um, that career as I was working on Root and Rebel and growing the blog until eventually I was able to make the blog my full-time job um, and replaced what my income as a journalist was um, and then some. And um, yeah, so I've been, I've been doing the blog now full-time for a couple years and I no longer freelance for those publications, um, but it was it was definitely a huge part of my life, and, and it was a difficult transition, of course, um, as any big career changes are. But I'm I'm really glad that I I made the switch. And did you know when you were traveling to all these exotic locations and eating in restaurants that you had PCOS, or or I mean, was it difficult for you to maintain your weight with all the travel and and all of that? So it. It varied because I didn't know that I had PCOS until 2014, and um, I had started doing this job um, back in 2008. So it was a long time of knowing that something was off, but not knowing what it was exactly. Um, and a lot of that time, I was on um, prescription, you know, hormonal hormonal birth control pills. Mm-hmm. So. Um, a lot of my symptoms were kind of masked and everything was, it was, it was impossible to figure out what was going on because my hormone levels were being synthetically altered and, you know, it was creating this just big mess. So it wasn't really until I came off the pill, um, that I was able to connect the dots and see that, um, 
that that lifestyle was not conducive to being healthy and managing my PCOS. Right. And I think that, um, it, it, you know, starts with that. When you get, come off birth control, you realize like, no, this is how it is. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, and you also had leaky gut syndrome as well. Uh, you're diagnosed with along with hypothyroidism. So that, that must have been difficult too, being a food writer with IBS, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yes, exactly. There were many months in the beginning that I was really just down about it and like, what am I going to do? And I loved my job and I didn't, um, in some ways I didn't want to have to make a change. And I really worried, like, how am I going to be able to do this? Um, but there were also a lot of other things going on, both in my professional and personal life, um, aside from my health that made it easier to make the switch. And, and I was fortunate in that I've always been freelance and an independent consultant, basically. And so I set my own schedule and made my own hours and that kind of thing. So it wasn't like I had to stop 100% and make a complete career shift. I really transitioned slowly over the course of like a year and a half where I was taking less freelance jobs and working more on the blog. And then, like I said before, kind of as the blog continued to grow and I was really enjoying being in that space and helping other women with their PCOS and feeling, you know, much more, my soul was like much more satisfied doing that kind of work. It was so much more fulfilling for me than writing about restaurants. And so that made it, um, just a lot easier. And, and I slowly transitioned out of, out of that job. So I was lucky in that I was able to make that transition slowly and at, at the pace that worked best for me. Now, now you recently had a baby and um, it, I wondered about if you could share, cause you have something in your blog that said how, you know, that you actually were able to conceive really trying the first time. Um, so could you share a little bit about that experience and how, um, what made it so much easier for you than, than it is for, for most women with PCOS. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, something that I had worried about forever. I mean, I think even before I knew I had PCOS, I just know that so many women struggle with fertility. And so I was always kind of scared that what if I do? And, and then especially after I was diagnosed with PCOS and a lot of conventional doctors were telling me, yeah, you're probably not going to be able to get pregnant. If you do, it's going to take a long time. It's going to be a really hard road. And I was just feeling, I was really anxious about it for years. Um, but I went off the pill in 2014 and that was not to get pregnant. It was really more to see what my body would do naturally and get rid of synthetic hormones and, and try to heal the root cause. And so after I worked on, on doing that for a few years, um, and at the end of 2017, my husband and I decided that we would try to get pregnant in the new year. Um, and it just so happened that the way that my cycle fell, um, I was ovulating right around Christmas. And so we were kind of doing that, like trying, but not trying thing. Like, eh, if it happens, we'll see. But our plan was really to start in January to start officially trying. Mm -hmm. And by January, I think January 11th, I had a positive pregnancy test in my hands and I was amazed um, that it happened so easily. And I 100% attribute it to all of the things I did over the previous years to regulate my hormones and just get my body into the healthiest place. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think that it's so great when that, that happens that your body just like, I don't know if you ever had problems with your cycles, um, syncing up or, you know, irregular yes. cycles or anything like that. But, um, a lot of times when we start to focus on foods that are healthy for us and, you know, getting our exercise routine going on and, you know, supplements going and um, the things that you did, uh, I think, you know, that, that really does go a long way and it's not overnight, but you weren't trying to get pregnant overnight either. So I think that's right. really good. Yeah. And I'm so glad that I started working on it before I was ready to get pregnant because I can't imagine, you know, it's so stressful just trying to get pregnant, even if you're perfectly healthy. If I was also trying to heal my body at that same time, and it did, it took a while for me to get into a place where my cycles were regular and I was symptom free and, you know, I wasn't having hormonal issues anymore. You know, if I was trying to do that 
all at the same time as I was desperate to have a baby, I mean, I can just see it would be so stressful. And it's just that vicious cycle where stress impacts fertility. And so, you know, I, I just think I'm really really glad and feel very lucky that I, I came into learning about PCOS when I did and was able to get my body into a place that was ready before I was really ready so that it, when it happened, when I was ready, it happened really quickly. That's awesome. So it, it took about three years or you basically waited about three years till you were off birth control since you were off birth control to actually start uh, thinking about trying. And so, yeah, I would say I was actually more like four years because okay. I got off birth control, like beginning of 2014 and then got pregnant at the very end of 2017. So it was like all of 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. Okay. All right. So, um, so what, what were, did your, could you give us a little bit of a picture of what did your cycles look like when you got off birth control? Oh, they were awful. It took me, I think, three months just to get my first cycle back after going off the pill. And I'd been on the pill since I was 16. Um, so it was a long time of having all of these synthetic hormones in my system. Um, so I I've, I've finally got my first period about two or three months after I went off the pill. And then from there, for the next year almost, it was just like every, it was so regular. I would get it every 60 days, every 75 days. Every, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. it, there was no rhyme or reason to it. And it was so frustrating. Um, just trying to get my cycles to regulate. Um, but eventually they did. And I would say it took probably two years to get to a place where it was really regular. Um, and then from there, it was like my cycles were probably a little bit longer than most women's, like, or the 28 day average that people talk about. And I had cycles that were more like every 32 days, mm -hmm. um, but they were consistently every 32 days um, for about two years before I got pregnant. That's awesome. So that was without medications. In other words, you were using like no metformin or anything, just basically nope. diet, exercise, supplements. And, uh, yeah, absolutely no prescription medications whatsoever. The only, you know, pills that I took were supplements. Um, and yeah, just changing my diet, my exercise, and then detoxing um, the products that I used as well. So let's talk a little bit about your skincare routine, because <laughs> I'm curious yeah. to know, um, you mentioned it in your blog too, about basically like a detoxification of um, household products and beauty products. And we have, uh, we had actually a patient the other day ask, you know, what, what line of products would you recommend that's natural? So if you have any suggestions at all um, for, for someone who wants to reduce toxic exposure, and I know there's, there's a lot of great brands out there that are more on the natural lines, but sometimes it's hard to really, um, I always ask what, what works for, for you in a specific situation. Um, so if you've had success with certain products, can you let us know what those are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's three lines that really stand out to me. Um, and just in case anybody doesn't know, I feel like I should preface it by saying that, um, you know, a lot of the products that we use on our skin, you know, just personal care products, shampoos, body wash, makeup, um, skin care, all of that, they contain um, endocrine disruptors and fake estrogens and other harmful chemicals that can mimic estrogen in the body, causing hormonal imbalances and leading to things like infertility. So it was really important to me, especially because I was estrogen dominant, to switch out the personal care products I was using to something that didn't contain those harmful things and that helped me balance my hormones. So the three lines that really stood out to me, um, the first is Beauty Counter and they are just an amazing company. They're, they do incredible things with advocacy in the um in like regulating um ingredient laws and things for the beauty industry so it's a company i'm really proud i'm actually a consultant with them and i'm really proud to be a part of of them it's such an incredible movement and they make awesome skincare and makeup um and also they make my all-time favorite sunscreen um so they have a lot of different products, but they are one of my favorites and they are all very clean, non-toxic. They don't have any of those fake estrogens and um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So love Beauty Counter. Mm -hmm. um, 
The second line is True Botanicals, and they are a little bit more expensive, but their clear line, um, they have a few different types for it based on your skin type, but they have a clear line that's for acne prone skin, which I really struggled with acne, especially on my cheeks and chin um, when my PCOS was really flaring up. And their skincare line just completely transformed my skin. It was one of the few things that really worked. Um, so I, I love True Botanicals. And the third one that is um, newer to me, I just been using it within the last six months or so, is Leilani Skincare, which is out of Hawaii. And they hand make um, all of their products. They smell incredible, but because of natural ingredients, not because of artificial fragrance. Um, and they have a lot of really good um, hydrating and brightening and exfoliating products that I just love using. And they just are such a treat. Nice. So we'll provide the links to those in our show notes because we hadn't really talked about skin that much. I noticed these last uh, last past year on the podcast and I, it's something that I wanted to get into. But since you mentioned it in your blog, I thought we could bring it up. And um, I, I am familiar definitely with Beauty Counter and I like their products. And um, I'm going to have to check out those other two because um, it sounds sounds amazing. I, I just stuck to coconut oil for my moisturizer for body moisturizer anyway. But, um, but for skincare, um, makeup lines, it's always... Kind of you know difficult sometimes to find like a good tinted sunscreen and that sort of thing that's not toxic so yeah um, yeah it is really hard to find and especially hard to find products that really work because that's the thing that i'm not willing to compromise is you know just because a product is maybe crunchy or you know it's it's lacking those ingredients but does it is it actually effective and um all three of those lines that i mentioned are really high performing they're you know, the same kind of quality you would get from like a Sephora type product. Um, they don't feel like they're, you know, too hippity dippity or, mm -hmm. or anything. So I think if for me, like I was addicted to Sephora and, um, you know, they've started coming out with some new lines that are more um, green and clean and that's great. But I really kind of moved away from shopping with them and, and now I'm pretty exclusive to beauty counter for makeup. Um, and I, I like that the quality kind of matches like what you're used to from those more higher end lines. Very nice. And the same with uh, your cleaning products. Do you have any specific uh, ones that you like, or do you like to make your own or, or what's the best that you've seen as far as cleaning wise? Yeah, great question. Um, cleaning products are another one that's just like it, it's amazing these things. I, I find that medicine and cleaning products are some of the most toxic products that we use. And you would think it would be the opposite, that they're there to make things better, healthier, you know, and and it's crazy what is allowed to be put in them. So mm -hmm. I actually, I've got a post on my website that's called my current green cleaning routine. Um, I also have one that's my um, current green beauty routine. So those are both great resources to check out like what I'm currently using and loving. I do make a lot of my own cleaning products. Um, so we have a ton of DIY recipes on the blog, but in terms of um, brands that if you aren't into DIY and you want to buy something, um, I, I'm always trying out different, different lines. Sorry, my cats are um, <laughs> <laughs> wrestling in the background. <laughs> I wonder what that was. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry about that. That's okay. um, so one line that I'm trying right now is called Supernatural. And it is one of these products that they send you these concentrates and you add them to water in a cleaning bottle and they smell so good. And, but they're all like essential oils and um, non-toxic ingredients. So there's no, you know, bleach and ammonia and it's, it's really just gross what's in there, um, conventional products. So I use those a lot. I also really like um, this company called Grove. They also do the concentrate um, option, which I really like. And they've got some clean products that I use a lot. And then Better Life. Um, and I just buy these on Amazon. And Better Life makes like, um, I use their I have marble countertops in my kitchen, so I use their granite and marble countertop spray, and um, and I also have some of their like bathroom cleaner and 
some other things like that. So yeah, those are kind of the three brands that I'm loving right now. Definitely. I, I play around with the doTERRA um, Purify, which is the, the essential you can you can make uh, as a cleaner and also diffuse it. And all. it's just very versatile. So I've been using that a little bit in spray bottles or sometimes just vinegar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice That's a lot smells. of my DIY recipes are just uh-huh. like vinegar and essential oils. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. It's great when it's yeah. good too. It's really nice, you know? Um, yeah. But, you really uh, don't need much. It's kind of amazing when you realize like what cleaning power things like vinegar and baking soda and, um, you know, even things like I use a dusting spray that I make that's just olive oil and vinegar and it's like salad dressing, but it works. Um, super well on wood surfaces and like as a furniture polish and dusting spray and really just you can make so many of your own cleaning products just with things you have in your pantry oh definitely we'll have to go check that out on your blog we'll we'll link to those and um so as far as getting back to um diet. I, I think that we were speaking a little bit before the interview, we talked about um, how you really focused on an anti-inflammatory diet, not so much, um, uh, you know, a keto or, um, you know, specific paleo plan. What was your, um, I guess, like, how did you, how did you find um, that particular diet work for you? And, and what did that really consist of usually? Yeah. So when I started going to um, the functional medicine doctor, she's the one who recommended that I follow an anti-inflammatory diet. And she was very, you know, careful to say it's not a diet in the traditional sense. Like it's not keto or paleo or something like that. It's really just sort of like a general way of eating. Um, And it's not super restrictive, which I think was really important for me because especially at the time I was still a food writer. um, And so it was like, I can't do some diet that's going to cut out, you know, major food groups and I I wouldn't be able to do my job. So I started reading this book called Clean Cuisine by Ivy Larson and she her book was also another game changer for me and she really helped me understand what inflammation in the body is, how it affects things like our hormones or digestion and um, why it's important to eat more anti-inflammatory foods and less pro-inflammatory foods. So I would say the main takeaway and how I really try to eat in my life is exactly that more good I focus more on more good and not cutting out foods necessarily. I mean, of course, if you have an allergy or sensitivity, that's a different story. But if you don't and you're like me and you're just trying to keep your hormones balanced and eat healthy and reduce inflammation, then I focus more on getting the good into my diet and I worry less about cutting out the bad, which happens naturally when you're eating more good anyway. Um, So yeah, there's just basically like the anti-inflammatory foods that I just try to incorporate in every meal. And when I do that, I feel my best. And what are, could you give us some examples of your favorite anti-inflammatory foods? Yes. So, I mean, the obvious start starting place is fruits and vegetables, and mm-hmm. it's not the um, sexiest answer or what seems like, oh, it's the big secret, but it truly is the number one thing, eating a nutrient-dense diet. Um, I always say, like, eat the rainbow, eat your colors. I try to get um, at least one, if not two, servings of fruits or vegetables in every meal. Um So that makes it really easy to still eat delicious food, but making sure a lot of women PCOS, you know, have nutrient deficiencies. Like I know personally, I was really low in vitamin B, vitamin Mm -hmm. D. Yep. Um, And so getting those nutrients is more important in my opinion than cutting out other foods. Um, So I start there. I really incorporate healthy fats into as many meals as I can as well. So lots of avocados, olive oil, nuts and seeds, salmon, um, things like that. Um, Sorry, it's a zoo over here. (laughs) You've got the baby in the background and some cats rolling around. I I I know. It's real life. Life is happening. Yes, that's fine. Life is definitely (laughs) happening over here. So healthy fats. Um, I try to get as many like fiber rich whole grains as I can. Um, grains are kind of a hot button issue, of course. Um, 
but for me, eating things like non-flour grains, especially, so things like quinoa, um, you know, rice, and those kinds of things that are naturally gluten-free and um, really fiber-rich have been important for me as well. Um, so sometimes the, the feeling of I have to restrict carbs can make you feel really tired. So I know that yeah. there are lots of people who have a lot of success with um, low carb diets and, and keto, but we try to say, let's focus on sustainability. Like we need, yes. you know, to, to focus on something you can do for life because PCOS doesn't go away. Um, it, the symptoms definitely go away, but they can come back. So and of course, if you go off, you know, um, eating anti-inflammatory foods or you stop exercising or you're not doing your supplements as well, or you're not taking care of yourself. So um, right. anytime you, anytime we see patients who have lost a lot of weight with, um, with a specific type of diet, you know, that's sometimes we see the same patients come back six months later and they've gained everything back. And I think it's just, yeah. it's been really frustrating for us over the years to watch our patients go through that and to see it uh, happen over and over again. So, you know, we just really made a decision that um, we don't, we don't want to emphasize a fad diet. We want to really like yeah. um, put something in place that is useful for, for life. That's uh, exactly my mentality as well. And like you said, you know, I think there is a place for um, some more specific or restrictive diets like keto or um, something like that. But I think for the majority of people that finding that sustainable um, way of eating is in the long term going to be so much better for you. And just even for your sanity, I mean, I think people really struggle with having to cut out so many food groups and, and we need carbs, you know, and yes. um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and sometimes I think it's things like the one thing that I did cut out almost a hundred percent, um, was caffeine except from tea. And that I feel like made a bigger difference than cutting out. Um, you know, I did, I, I experimented of course. So I did whole thirties and I've done, you know, um, different elimination diets and things where I see, okay, does cutting out grains or soy or this or that have an impact? And the thing I found most was that caffeine really impacted me. Um, and I've since taken a few tests that like 23 and me that test your, um, like caffeine metabolism basically. And they've also come back saying that I don't have a good one, that caffeine really does impact me um, more than other people. So I just switched to decaf coffee and guess what? Tastes the exact same. And I don't have to deal with the anxiety and the jitters and the, um, you know, adrenal dysfunction from having too much caffeine. So that was one thing that I feel like made a bigger difference than cutting out food groups. Definitely. Right. And the more we restrict sometimes, you know, that, that can also play a part in depression and anxiety when we're not also getting yes. enough fatty acids and, and vitamins and nutrients for our body. So that's for sure. So I, I think that if you could recommend um, one of your personal habits that contributed the most to your success, I know you already said cutting out caffeine, but um, with you overcoming PCOS, really, I mean, it, you have reversed uh, it seems like a lot of things and, and been able to get pregnant easy and maintain your weight. Um, so what's been the thing that you think like one of the, your personal habits that's really been the most uh, important, would you say? Oh gosh, there's so many um, that I feel like really did make a big impact without having like requiring a lot of sacrifice on my end. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is doing hot yoga. That was something I used to be a very like high intensity exerciser or I'd feel like, okay, I should go for a run or something. And a lot of these things can burn out our adrenals and, you know, raise our cortisol levels and things that impact um, our hormones and can make my PCOS flare up. So when I started doing more gentle exercise that helped with my anxiety as well, um, that really made one of the biggest differences to me. And even on a superficial level as well, you know, I felt like I've never been more in shape or, you know, happy with my body and how, how strong I've been and that kind of thing than when I got into a regular hot yoga practice. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. And yoga is great for so many different things. I mean, just, I always say like, give, give it a try at least, even if it's a DVD or like a, some videos that you're watching on, on YouTube, but um, it, just for a few minutes a day, it's just hard for a lot of people to get into a routine, especially when um, yeah. you're working 40 hours and commuting and all the kinds of stuff. So um, and just a little bit a day, I think is super important. And um I, I guess like I, I really think that um, there's sometimes a sense of hopelessness with PCOS. So I think you've given a lot of women hope that there's you can turn things around. It might not be overnight. It could take a few years. <laughs> sometimes, you know, it takes a little um, work. But, you know, now that you've kind of maintained everything, is it is it a little bit easier for you as far as to just implement some of these things? Yes, I'm so glad you said that because I, I was just thinking that, that Yes, it did take a while, but it was so worth it, of course. And now I feel like I am so much more lax about a lot of things that I was really intense about in the beginning because I've gotten to a place where I really understand my body so much better and I can, you know, catch things earlier and, and it's just easier. Um, it's so much easier and I don't have to be as strict or, um, to maintain and it's always easier to maintain than it is to heal right and have to react so just kind of being proactive is is important and being proactive is much easier than having to be reactive so yeah. definitely kind of get, yeah it becomes part of you <laughs> really yeah does. it does mm -hmm. and you're providing your your kids with a great life you know i mean as far as um you're already you've already done a lot of the groundwork so you know it's kind of hard when you're bringing a little one into the world and you have to think oh you know there's so much toxicity in the out there i mean with even the baby products are are pretty toxic mm -hmm. a lot of them so like trying to green your nursery and do those things and choose you know the right foods and all that um you kind of were greening along the way so it wasn't a big you know change I would think when you when you started to do that for um, postpartum in a way so um, right yeah it does it becomes much more a part of you and then it makes those kinds of things easier you already have a lot of the knowledge that you need and you know a lot of the brands that you know are doing things right and putting health above profits and that kind of thing so yeah it definitely makes it easier and for any um, moms listening, we have a lot of non-toxic mom and baby resources on Root Prepple as well. I have a green nursery guide and, um, you know, my favorite baby products that kind of fit that bill. And yeah, but awesome. it is, it's just an ongoing process and, and it can be overwhelming and you can feel sometimes, like you said, just defeated or like, oh gosh, everything is toxic and there's nothing no good out there, but, but there is. And, um, once you kind of get into this world, I think it becomes a lot easier. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, what is the best way our listeners can connect with you? I would just say to head over to the blog, it's rootandrebel.com. Um, you can also follow along on social media. I'm pretty active on Instagram. So I'm just at root and rebel there. And if anybody wants to talk to me about beauty counter or, um, or anything else PCOS related or otherwise, they can just reach out to me via email, which is listed on my blog, but it's just Kate at root and .com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today. And I really appreciate all the, the wisdom you've shared with us. I can't wait to check out more articles on your blog too. It's amazing. So, so thanks everybody for listening and for all of you have a wonderful week. We'll catch you next time. And that's the end of this episode of the PCOS Revolution podcast. If you've enjoyed the show and want to help me spread the word about how women with PCOS and hormonal imbalances can lead happier, more healthier lives, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to have a question answered on the show or would like to recommend a guest, please go to floridacompletewellness.com slash podcast. If you're on social media, you can follow me at facebook.com slash Florida Complete Wellness and twitter.com slash Florida Complete, where I post a lot of interesting research, webinars, and articles on our blog about really getting to the root of hormonal imbalances like PCOS. So it's a great way to stay in touch with the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening and see you soon. Mm -hmm.